Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 20th and final meeting before summer recess. There are no apologies. Our first item is the decision on whether to take items five and six in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed, thank you. Our second item of business today is an evidence session on the interim report on the independent review of complaints handling, investigations and misconduct issues in relation to policing. And I'm very pleased to welcome to the committee today Humza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Neil Hasty, Head of Scottish Government Community Safety Unit, Anita Popplestone, Scottish Government Police Division, and Julia Roberts, Scottish Government Police Division also. I refer members to paper one, which is a private paper, and uh, ask you to make some opening uh, remarks, Cabinet Secretary. But before I do so, I want to thank you on behalf of the committee for um, making the time to uh, present and um, give evidence so soon after the publication of the independent, uh, of the interim report. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Camina. My apologies for, for running a couple of uh, minutes late. Uh, both Lord Advocate and I are very grateful to Dame Alicia Angelini for the significant and detailed work that she's undertaken so far. I, I spoke with Dame Alicia uh, briefly yesterday just to convey my thanks to her prior to her appearance uh, before this committee. When my predecessor commissioned this review jointly with the Lord Advocate, the intention was that it would assess how well the current framework is working uh, and suggest where improvements could be made. I'm sure the committee will agree with me that under Dame Alicia's leadership, the review is bringing rigorous, independent scrutiny to the framework and processes for handling complaints against the police and investigating serious incidents and alleged misconduct. Convener, I'm sure the committee will recognise that for the vast majority of time, the many thousands of police in Scotland work selflessly, they work tirelessly and often courageously in the course of their job. The report acknowledges that this is not an easy job, and as Justice Secretary, I'm especially grateful to all those who have chosen to serve the public in this way. But equally, it is important that when things go wrong, the police are held to account, that lessons are learned and that improvements are made. My predecessor believed, as I do, that we need to continually improve the system so that roles and responsibilities are clear, so that there is transparency and openness, and so that there is accountability in the upholding of fundamental human rights. I believe that Dame Alicia's preliminary report gives us some important suggestions as to how we can improve the system. The Lord Advocate and I very much welcome this comprehensive report, but given that it was only published on Friday, we've obviously not had the opportunity to consider and discuss in depth its substantial findings. Uh, we will, of course, carefully consider the recommendations and engage with our partners and key stakeholders on implementation. <clears throat> it's vital that such a detailed analysis and reflection be carried out in consultation with the principal organisations identified in the report before next steps are confirmed. As I've made clear to the committee before, where there is unanimous agreement among stakeholders that a specific measure can be implemented quickly in order to fix something, then we will seek to do that. Identifying and agreeing those measures will, of course, take some time, but I am happy to provide an update to the committee on progress after recess. Many of the themes and recommendations from the Justice Committee's report on its post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire uh, Reform Act 2012 are picked up in Dame Alicia's report. Obviously, we'll be looking at both reports in tandem when setting out next steps. Uh, Lord Advocate and I will respond to Dame Alicia on her recommendations in full before the 1st of December later this year. I again thank her for her work so far and look forward to discussing that with the committee this morning. I now move to questions and can I start by referring you to your response to the committee's recommendation on complaints handling when you stated where there is unanimous agreement among stakeholders that specific measures can be implemented quickly. There's no reason why they shouldn't seek to do that. So now that you've had sight of Dame Eilish's interim report where there are various recommendations which um, require legislative change. Can you give the committee some assurance that these will be implemented quickly? Convena, thank you for the question. Just as I said in my statement, where there is unanimous agreement by partners that we should move quickly, then I see no reason why we should delay that. So in terms of the legislative changes and the couple of legislative changes that are suggested within the report, um, of course, those will be part of the measures that I discussed during the summer recess. 
with stakeholders uh, and to see whether there can be agreement. So, uh, and f you'll forgive me, it's, it's a couple of days after the report. I, I won't commit to anything at this committee to, to absolutely tell you what we will be doing. But what I will do uh, is, of course, move with haste and pace uh, because it's such an important matter. Um, so where there is agreement and what is in our gift, um, and, and of course there are recommendations that are in the gift of the government, I will do. Uh, of course, when it is legislative changes that are required, uh, again, the convener will be only too aware of this because of her role. Um, where there is legislative change, of course, we would have to look at the parliamentary timetable, we would have to look at other parliamentary pressures that exist, uh, and so on and so forth. So I could only work at a pace that Parliament perhaps would allow me to do so. But notwithstanding all of that, uh, I reiterate what I've said previously, uh, what I've said in this statement, that where there's agreement, unanimous agreement from stakeholders, uh, to move quickly on something, there should be no reason to delay that. Can I press you perhaps a little bit more on that, Cabinet Secretary? Obviously, this is an important report. You said so in your opening remarks. And uh, I think our committee were absolutely unanimous that the recommendations made important improvements. So rather than just see where we could fit it into the legislative programme, Will you make a case for prioritising making these changes in the legislative programme? I think that's a fair, fair, fair request. And where there is unanimous agreement, uh, where there is the agreement that the best route to achieve what Dame Alicia has suggested is through legislation, then uh, of course I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation with uh, colleagues in parliamentary business. But clearly, it would take the endeavours of not just the government, but the entire parliament to, 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 to progress these matters. If, if we can get to the outcome that Dame Alicia's trying to get to without legislative change, of course, that's almost always a preferable route because I think, you know, committee and members here would understand that legislation and changing and amending legislation is not, a, 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 I'm afraid, a quick fix in these matters. But um, if we can only get there through legislation, uh, there is unanimous agreement uh, then clearly I'll, I'll do my best to progress that as quickly as possible. Not always in my gift, I must say. It's very much a, a conversation that has to take place with Parliament. I think the committee members will do all we can to help. I can say that. Um, Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about um, the time that's been taken, um, that has been taken to investigate complaints. Um, we've heard that the complaints process can be um, lengthy and, and has, that can often have a de detrimental effect on the complainers and on the, the subject of the complaints. Um, do you think the policing bodies currently have the necessary resources um, to provide as quick a resolution as possible for, for everyone involved? You know, does it even come down to resources? And um, we, Dame Eilish said yesterday she would be looking to possibly try and streamline the process um, to make recommendations for that in her final report. Um, can, can, can you comment at all on, on that? Um, just the, the time taken that's yeah. been evident? Uh, I, I can completely understand uh, from Dame Eilish's report the... Um, the concerns that she has around the time that can take for, for complaints, particularly complaints involving senior officers, because that can have a particularly destabilising effect. Um, so she makes some some very serious uh, recommendations that we should and uh, we will give consideration to. Um, she, she also talks about streamlining, as, as you rightly say. Um, I think Dame Leash was pretty clear um, in her evidence session to, to this committee that um, you know, the majority of complaints that come through are, are not complaints of gross misconduct. Um, they could be dealt with by other routes and other avenues, a lot of them grievances that could be dealt with by HR route and so on and so forth. So streamlining is hugely important. There is also the complexity. I think it would be you know, wrong of us not to, 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 to recognise that the complaints landscape is complex. You know, and I'm Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and I can tell you it's complex. And other people uh, that are making a complaint, there are a variety of bodies depending on the complaint, and then the referral process and so on and so forth. Uh, th th there's no denying that there's a complex landscape. So streamlining is, is hugely important. Hopefully that cuts out a lot of unnecessary time uh, that is involved in, in some of this. In terms of the question on, 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 on resource, um, we recognised that there was an increase in the workload of the park, so we increased their resources by, by over a third, by over 33%. <coughs> they, they have a proposal 
uh, budget proposal, uh, no doubt that they'll they'll make for the next spending review, and of course we'll we'll look at that and give that consideration in relation to the spending review. Um, I won't rehearse too much what I've said about police budgets, and you know we we we're protecting the police's revenue budget, and of course giving them a capital uplift. Um, so it'll be up to to the police to determine. Um, how, how they choose to, to, to spend that. And then there are questions um, for, for what is known as Cap D, criminal allegations against um, police division. Um, so, and, 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 but that is, is, is very much to do with the Crown Office uh, and clearly a matter for, for the Lord Advocate, which the member may wish to raise with him direct. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary and a panel. You, you touched on your Cabinet Secretary on the uh, complexity, and that that's something uh, certainly the committee's heard. Do you think that that's partly uh, due to the, the number of organisations that are involved in the complaints process? And do you have any uh, initial ideas from the, the report about how the complaints process can be simplified? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll be... Uh, if the member will forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, reluctant to... to be as firm as I would and I will be hopefully after recess because I, I would like to have discussions with partner or principal partner organisations about the way forward but as, as a more general um, a couple of things, I, I reiterate yes I, I agree with that rec that suggestion that the complaints landscape is complex I think we have to recognise that, I think it's important for all of us involved to recognise that not deliberately so, I think it is a nature of, 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 of the type of allegations, the nature of the scrutiny bodies and, and, and the fact that police is rightly one of the most scrutinised organisations um, that we have in the country. It is right that they are because of the power that is invested uh, in the police, uh, by the police. So therefore the scrutiny has to be to the level it's at. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there's too many scrutiny organisations. I would, I, I would re reject that suggestion because I think each of those organisations, the SPA, the role they play is important. The Park, extremely important. Audit Scotland, of course, and the role they play, of course, the committees in this parliament. So the scrutiny of Police Scotland, I, I wouldn't suggest that there's too, too, too many organisations uh, involved. In terms of, 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 of ways forward, you know, there's a variety of suggestions that, 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 that are made um, by, by Dame Alish, uh, Angelina. It was um, obviously a poured over a report a few times since its uh, release and... Um, you know, particularly interested in, in kind of what she says in paragraph uh, 181, 182, which is about misconduct proceedings in particular. Again, recognising the vast majority of cases are, are not gross misconduct, but um, this is both for misconduct and, and gross misconduct for senior against senior officers. And her suggestion of an independent, independent legally chaired panel uh, appointed by a very senior member of the judiciary, such as the Lord President. So there's, you know, recommendations... Such as this one, I think, should be given uh, very serious consideration, will be given very serious consideration. Not entirely in my gift to say that these things should happen, but certainly uh, with partner organisations, I think if we can get unanimity around some of these suggestions, uh, we will have a, a, a more robust uh, complaints uh, procedure and landscape for all. I think whatever we do, um, it's going to be quite important for stakeholders to have a, even if it's on, on, on the website, a very kind of one stop shop almost or portal where members of the public can go to to understand that complaints procedure. There are bits of it, you can go to the Police Scotland's website and there is a complaint section and so on and so forth. But I think just a, something that is very easy to read, is not full of acronyms, um, is, is, is really digestible, um, I think would be quite helpful. So I think whatever we end up settling on, um, we should make sure that there is an easy to read, easy to understand format for the public to to to, to to uh, be directed to. Um, th thanks for that, Cabinet Secretary. You, you've um, nicely anticipated my, my, my next question, which was about uh, the communication to the, the public and, and speaking, if you like, in, in plain language, because it is, as, as you've said, a very complex system. I think you've you've basically answered that, but would you say that based on your answer there, that, that just now, currently, you know, it, it, it's fair to say that members uh, of the public are likely to, to struggle um, with the current complaints procedure? I mean, in, in, in a word, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I think, as I say, it's quite a complex landscape and I think we should reflect very carefully on what Dame Alicia says about, you know, trying to, to make it a less land, like, complex. Now, by some, we'll, we'll only be able to do that to, to, to some extent. In some regards, um, it will be difficult because 
there are different bodies that have different roles and responsibilities, and that's for very good reason. Um, but I think we can definitely make it uh, a less complex landscape than it currently is. Yeah. Uh, Daniel. Morning. Um, one of the areas which I think potentially could be acted on sooner rather than later is regarding interagency relationships. And uh, indeed, I think uh, Dame Eilish's interim report is quite strong on that. On paragraph 277, uh, she, uh, I think, characterised the relationship as, as being one of suspicion at times. And I think in particular, she's referring to the relationship between Police Scotland and the Park, but also in paragraph, uh, I believe, 151, she describes the, the, the relationship between the SPA and the Park regarding pre pre preliminary assessments as, as being uh, not entirely as functional as it, it should be. I was just wondering if, the, if your reflections were similar and, and what actions might be taken in the short term to try and improve those relationships and put them on a, a better uh, and more functional footing. Can I agree with Daniel Johnson on the the premise of his, his question? And, and I, would, I would have to agree because it's very clear in Dame Malicia's, uh report from, from the various paragraphs uh, he, he mentions. I'm not sure it's 151 necessarily, but um, certainly 277. Plus um, 104, I think, make for, for quite stark reading about the relationships. Um, and that gives me cause for concern. What I would say to Daniel Johnson, I, I, I think he will appreciate this, is there's only so much I can do as the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Um, uh, I am very keen that these relationships are constructive and I, I, I'm very happy to say I have a really constructive relationship with the Chief Constable and the Chair, for example, of the SPA. Um, now, of course, with the, the park, but you know, we've met on, 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 on only a, a few occasions. So there is a new commissioner coming in, uh, of course, and personalities uh, may play a part in, in, in those conversations moving forward. But I think the recommendation for Dame, from, from Dame Alicia Angelini about a working group is hugely important for that very purpose. Because instead of having, as she describes it, cynicism, suspicion, and I think suboptimal relationships, if I get her word incorrect, you know, if the working group can understand that scrutiny <clears throat> and uh, handling complaints is in the interest of everybody in terms of public confidence and policing, then hopefully that working group can start off in a positive footing to help with those relationships. So, um, Darren Johnson will forgive me that, 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 that there is, of course I will reflect on those recommendations. Um, I think the working group is a good step. Other than that, um, I will reflect carefully, but I'm not sure that there's entirely in the gift of, of, of government to help those relationships um, become more, more, more constructive. I entirely un understand and, and indeed uh, agree, but uh, 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 I'm pleased to, to hear the Cabinet Secretary uh, believes that this is a priority. And just for the record, it's, it was paragraph 158, not 151, uh, that I meant to say. I was, however, uh, I think um, yesterday listening to Dame Eilish, concerned that perhaps the, the recommendations for improving those were primarily at the governance level. And I, while I agree the working group will be helpful, um, and indeed, new, a new commissioner may well change matters. Some of these issues clearly reside at the level of, of um, practice and indeed the, the, the people within the park and in, within the police themselves. And I was just wondering uh, uh, whether the Cabinet Secretary would reflect that thought that those sort of working relationships at kind of ground level also need to be improved. While I also bear in mind that some of those relationships are absolutely outside the scope of, of ministerial uh, direction or influence. Yes, <clears throat> I think he's, uh, Daniel Jones is right, and, and, and we should reflect on that. I, I should say, when, when, I, when I mentioned that a new commissioner is coming in, that is in, in, in no way a uh, slight to, to, to the current commissioner uh, at all. I think people would recognise that she's done a very diligent job. Uh, she's uh, appeared in front of this committee on many occasions, and, and, and everybody can see the seriousness with which she, she takes her, her, her role and the effort that she has personally put in. I simply make the point that when new people come into an organisation, often that's a chance to refresh and reset some of those uh, conversations and, 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 and relationships. Um, I, I take his point on, uh, I think with the suggestions that Dame Leash makes, and if we move on some of those, and our principal partner organisations also move on some of those, 
changes, then that can potentially in itself help to, to, to foster a better relationship through the governance arrangements. But but ultimately, I'll, I'll be I'll be honest, in, in, in the years that I've been a government minister, nothing beats just getting around the table. And if you need to air some of those conversations, difficult conversations, um, you're much better getting around the table and having those very frank, robust conversations and it helps frankly to let people vent what they feel are are, are, are some of their issues and, and hopefully gets people working around a constructive uh, manner so yes I accept that we should reflect on, on what Daniel Johnson says I'm hopeful also that the working group will, 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 will make a difference to those relationships Thank you um, I think John was going to come up before we, we leave that, that area I, I think um, Cabinet Secretary do you agree with Dame Elish's view that she expressed yesterday, the relationship between the SPA, when we're looking at relationships, and Police Scotland uh, could be perceived as too cosy. I, I thought that was an interesting uh, observation. I, I get exactly where Dame Elish Angelini's uh, coming from. Uh, I think she was mentioning specifically in relation to senior officers and the SPA. Uh, and I think in Scotland, I've often said we're such a, a small country that you know, everybody ends up knowing, knowing everybody. But particularly, we look at senior officers, a small handful of senior officers who work quite closely with the SPA, who are themselves a small team. Uh, at the very least, there could be a perception that there's familiarity and, and, and the relationship is, is too cosy. So I, I think the suggestions that Dame Elise Angelini makes to try to, to make sure that that perception uh, doesn't exist um, then I, I think we should reflect on, on, on her suggestions very, very uh, seriously. I already mentioned um, the suggestions that Dame Elise Angelini makes, the recommendations she makes about an independently legally chaired board uh, in paragraph 182. Um, I, I read that um, paragraph and that suggestion recommendation um, you know, with a lot of seriousness. Uh, I think it's something I'll take as a matter of of, um, of urgency in terms of my conversations uh, with partner organisations because I think even the perception of the relationships being too cosy is not good for public confidence. Supplementary, Rona. Yes, thank you. It was really a supplementary to uh, Daniel Johnson's questions. Um, paragraph 317 um, refers to the fact that um, the police are increasingly called to deal with people with mental health problems, um, which can sometimes spark um, complaints against the police. Um, and, and some of the people involved in minor incidents are taken to the police, um, police stations rather than a place of, of health or, or safety. Um, the, the paragraph refers about to avoid escalation of, of the situation. It requires multi-agency communication and cooperation between police and healthcare um, agencies. I just wondered if I could have your, your view on that, if you think that this is something that should be addressed in the final report. Yes, I, I look forward to, to, to obviously the final report and its detail, but even before this report was, was released, the committee will be well aware of the fact that this has been a long-standing issue for police officers um, around uh, the amount of time that is, is spent on distress calls and vulnerable people. The committee will also be aware that um, at the moment we have the rollout of the, the CAMS uh, system uh, for, for police handling of, of, of calls, um, the, that contact assessment model um, will hopefully at the triage stage be able to direct calls of vulnerability to the appropriate places that they should go. It doesn't mean that police officers still won't attend mental health calls and distress calls. I'm sure they, they, they still do and will, but it hopefully will reduce the number. As well as that, the, the Health and Justice Collaboration Board is looking at this issue and, and, and is looking to see where we can target resource. Again, uh, to, 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 to where it might be better placed to handle distress calls and people with vulnerability. Um, it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, it means the police can use their time m more productively, but also for the individual that's concerned, it means that they are being treated by somebody who's better suited to their needs, which should hopefully mean there would be a reduction in complaints to the police. Um, but it, where there are complaints um, of, the, of this nature, they should, of course, be treated in the most appropriate manner and way um, but uh, hopefully we can we can we can reduce them uh, by by getting the appropriate person to see them in the first place. Thank you, John. Thank you, Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Panel on Cabinet Secretary. I, I asked Amy Ellis yesterday about her recommendations nine and ten, which cover the, the softer elements, if you like, of of the complaints process. Now you, you touched on this briefly in the opportunity that 
um, robustly followed um, um, a grievance procedure can avert um, things escalating. Um, it's certainly the view that some of the matters that have, have escalated quite considerably may um, have been uh, more appropriately addressed by way of a grievance procedure. Um, that will require, of course, necessary training, not just for the managers, but for all members of staff, both police, and st uh, um, uh, police officers and police staff, to understand the options that's available to them and the route to be followed. Uh, could you comment on that, please? I, I did uh, pick up on John Finney's uh, questioning of, of Damien Leach in, in this regard. And uh, if I just pick up on, on some of what she said, um, first things first, um, she did say that she would return to this issue uh, in her final report, I think is important. Obviously, we give her the time and the space to, to do that. I found it very interesting. I mean, uh, John, John Finney comes from a policing background, so we can all understand this uh, well. Um, but, but I think even if you're not from a policing background, uh, you can understand where there may be, for example, a kind of relatively uh, flat organisational structure where there are priority opportunities to be promoted and, and, and you're not promoted. Um, they can lead to frustrations um, and issues you know, that elsewhere would be treated as grievances are, are, are not. They're escalated to, 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 to kind of misconduct um, and disciplinary procedures, whereas Dame Alish's central suggestion that kind of earlier intervention which um, seeks to, to address behaviour, support officers through HR routes, prevent that escalation, I think, is hugely important. But the training aspect is also um, a point that Dame Leash uh, makes in, in terms of training of frontline officers in mediation um, and in, in customer handling, I think, as it's described. But in mediation, I think, is, is, is hugely important for our partners in Police Scotland to consider. I'm sure they will reflect on it, uh, but, but, but I think a number of the grievances that come forward um, if there is a way of dealing with them appropriately, but in a way that does not require that escalation to, to misconduct, then, of course, that is um, hopefully preferable to, to all. But again, we'll reflect on that, and, of course, we'll wait for Dame Alicia's final report, to which will return to this issue. I wonder, Captain Seger, did you have a view um, if, as an institution, the police is risk-averse in relation to personnel matters of this nature and may resort more readily to the more punitive forms rather than managerial forms if disposing of incidents? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's born out of a good place in the sense that, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, police take their responsibilities in these matters uh, very, very seriously. Um, it, you know, we have to remember that Police Scotland uh, and, and its, its national police service form, of course, is, is still a relatively young and new organisation. So um, it may be a function of that also. Um, but whether it's risk aversiveness, whether it's some other issue, I, I couldn't really comment uh, with, with, with too much knowledge, I'm afraid, on, on that specific point. But what I would say is, um, you know, Dame Alish makes some, some, I think, important recommendations, although she will return to the issue in her final report. I think what she recommends in her interim report should be, and I'm sure will be given consideration by Police Scotland. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, 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 that was certainly one of the conversations I would like to take forward with with partner organisations. I, I thought that the comment about frontline resolution, um, um, particularly with the mediation and customer handling, would be um, potentially um, hugely important, given the, the source of many complaints. And you heard Dame Elish talk about some things that, uh, of course, are important to the individual, but in the relative scheme of things, you know, be it in another workplace, wouldn't be viewed in that way. The, perhaps the challenge for Police Scotland is that even a day's training is a significant undertaking given the number of personnel. Is that something that might be looked at in relation to budgetary considerations at all, Cabinet Secretary? Well, and I, I know your kind of colleague, uh, Mr Mackay, will have <laughs> many representations, but um, yeah. it's, it, there's a significant, the abstraction of staff, the backfilling to actually facilitate training on that scale that may be required is important. But, uh, again, as, as, as John Finney will know from his, his personal uh, experience, the good thing is, of course, Police Scotland have in place a really rigorous training uh, procedure. I mean, whether it's for new starts, of course, with their, their time in, in, in Tully Allen, uh, or indeed with current officers, as we saw with the rollout of the domestic abuse training for the new legislation, they're able to, to, to take forward uh, kind of large-scale training opportunities 
um, at, at relative speed, I would say. Um, but of course, there is a budgetary consideration, as there was with the Domestic Abuse Act training. Um, and therefore, if, if Police Scotland come with specific budgetary proposals in that uh, regard, of course, they'll be considered within the wider spending review picture. I'm afraid it's that line that, uh, that I'll often give, but it's an important one because um, you know there'll be a variety of budgetary pressures. In fact, I've come in front of this committee and uh, there's been a variety of requests around budgetary pressures uh, as well. So we'd have to... To, to, to consider that in the round, but um, in terms of the, the general thrust of what's being discussed about discussed around the training of frontline officers and mediation and customer handling, I think it's one that should be given very very serious consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, supplementary, <coughs> Daniel. So I think John Finney raised a, an interesting point for, for a report that has stems from complaints. I think Dame Elish makes a number of comments regarding police culture, which didn't mm. necessarily have to. So, uh, on top of what Finney has mentioned about grievances, paragraph 106, um, the, the, she states, resentment around promotion could also be exacerbated by factions, favouritism or litigiousness, which existed historically within different parts of policing. And then likewise, in paragraph 108, um, she goes on to describe how in the focus group, uh, she, she found that not all line managers understood the management of performance or how to use performance regulations. I was just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary would uh, agree with me that, I mean, I think these certainly give the, should give the, the Chief Constable and the, the Force Executive some pause for thought around police culture and, and practice. Uh, and I was just wondering whether he would agree with me that... He, I think one would want to see some action taken on those cultural aspects which have been highlighted, which I don't think necessarily we might have expected to see in this report. Yes, I very simply just uh, agree with Daniel Johnson. Um, you know, I, I think, again, bearing in mind that we have eight legacy forces coming in together, two central organisations obviously, but eight legacy forces coming together, there may have been quite good HR practice in terms of feedback of why you didn't get a promotion, uh, why you didn't get a certain position. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But clearly, from what Dame Alicia Angelini is, is is saying here, that um, across the board, um, the organisation has to look at that feedback loop um, when it when it comes to issues around uh, promotions. But it's more than that. Um, she 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 does uh, she does talk about the need to have to even give negative feedback, which can be can can maybe be tricky. Um, telling constables they're not ready for promotion reluctant to consult HR professionals and Police Scotland to get advice on staffing issues. For me, those paragraphs that Daniel Johnson mentions, particularly 108, uh, I think you know, really need to be looked at um, by, by, by Police Scotland. They will be, I'm certain of that. Um, but you would think that there, if there, was a, if there was a really positive focus on that and a really positive outcome um, in terms of how to deal with that HR from you know in, 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 in a way that provided that feedback and was positive even if you don't get a promotion opportunity which of course can be difficult to, to, to take then I can imagine that the grievances and the complaints would drastically reduce so it's in really everybody's interest that those paragraphs that Daniel Johnson highlights particularly I would say 106 and, and, and 106 to 108 um, sh should be uh, of, of, of focus for the Chief Constable and, 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 and colleagues in Police Scotland. Shona. Uh, a couple of uh, questions on transparency. We, <coughs> you touched on briefly earlier on. Um, one of the issues that you probably have um, seen in the, the report is that, um, that people don't feel that they're being given enough information with which to pursue uh, complaints, and it's been suggested that this could uh, be improved um, by um, policing bodies having a, a duty uh, to provide complainants with regular updates on the progress of their complaints, uh, the procedures being followed and provided with a, a named contact. Uh, is that something that you think has merit and that you would support? I obviously realise you've not had much time to digest some of the recommendations, but is your instinct that that might be something that's helpful? I think we just probably want to be be careful that, um, you know, where we can improve the transparency um, and do it in, in, in a way that is, is, is swift, is important. And, and there are suggestions about um, 
legislative change and so on and so forth, and I'm not dismissing them. I think we should give them careful consideration. But if we can do things relatively quickly that improve the transparency that carries the unanimous support, but also I would hope the confidence of the public, then 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 then, then we should look to do that. Um, my view is that, you know, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the, the current landscape is complex. I think that probably gives rise to some element of public suspicion. Again, it's just a perception. I don't think it's deliberately meant to be complex, um, but it probably gives rise to, 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 to some public suspicions in that regard. So some of the suggestions that I made absolutely around kind of name contact and so on and so forth that Sean Robinson mentions, we should all give serious consideration to um, and, 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 and uh, do what we can to improve any lack or perceived lack of transparency uh, in the system. Uh, do you think uh, a similar uh, duty that's um, being suggested for complainants, c do you think that could be something that could uh, also be provided to those who are the subject of, of complaints? Um, again, I think we should give it some consideration. I, I think we read very clearly from Dame Alicia's report um, the effect that complaints can have on, of course, the one that makes the complaint, but also clearly on the one that's being complained about. Um, and I think it's important that when we're talking about fairness and transparency, uh, we don't forget that there are often two sides of an allegation there, and, and we have to make sure that um, <clears throat> the appropriate steps are put in place that, of course, give rise to public confidence, and greater rise to public confidence, but are also fair to all those that are involved. And I think we just have to take a bit of time to reflect on the suggestions that are made to see how we can give that uh, confidence and inject um, even further fairness into to, to the system. OK. Um, <coughs> you'll probably be aware that the, the, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner has um, expressed some concern about the, the level of discretion that Police Scotland currently has to categorise and investigate uh, complaints in the first instance. Um, do you think the Commissioner's concern is, is justified uh, in this respect? Uh, obviously, we had some discussion about this yesterday, um, particularly in relation to serious complaints um, having been inappropriately recorded. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to reflect on what Elish Angelini has said in this regard, but... Uh, yeah. Your initial comments? Yeah, I mean, from my, my kind of initial comments on, on some of this, it was interesting that, um, again, when it came to the most senior, uh, serious complaints made about senior officers, uh, Dame Alish, um has a suggestion about the various stages and steps that that should go through and how that should initially be kind of triaged and then uh, potentially referred on. And I know the, the Commissioner has come in front of this committee on, 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 on occasion and suggested. Um, that uh, that uh, there is is too much discretion and perhaps is a further role uh, for for the park. Um, um, you know, my understanding from reading the report, so I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, is that the, the Dame Elish didn't really consider Park's proposed triage role was was necessary. Um, she suggested that Park should be using its powers to to audit Police Scotland and the SPA's complaints handling process. Uh, and carry out research before any consideration of a, a, a triage uh, role. Um, I think we need to be careful. Any proposals don't have, you know, don't potentially and um, have an un unintended consequence of creating um, an additional bureaucracy um, that's not warranted for the vast majority um, of complaints, um, which related to quality of service. So uh, that wouldn't be uh, necessary, uh, proportionate, or, or, or logical. So I think we just have to weigh these these matters up. But um, yeah, I noticed I thought it quite stark actually that Dame Elish didn't um, didn't didn't consider that um, proposed triage role any further. Okay. Ninka. Good morning. Good morning. I, I'd take your cabinet secretary into the area of investigation of criminal complaints for me. Uh, so as you know, <clears throat> Police Scotland have a discretion to decide whether a complaint is a criminal allegation or if it's not, and whether it should be referred to the Crown Office for an independent investigation. Uh, do you take a view on whether Police Scotland have been carrying out that uh, process effectively uh, at this stage? And 
has the Crown Office raised any concerns with you about that particular element? Um, first things first, I mean, uh, the, the, there was a reason uh, and a good reason why it was my predecessor who jointly commissioned the review with Lord Advocate. Um, and Lord Advocate, I know, has written to Dame Alicia Angelini uh, to thank her for her preliminary report, um, but he will be the one that will determine what is appropriate for uh, the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal to, to take forward, and his independent remit, I think, is important. To, 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 to recognise um, that. I also noted in the report of, of, of the committee's post-legislative scrutiny, um, the committee welcomed the measures introduced by, by the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service to provide reassurance that Police Scotland is identifying and reporting appropriate cases. Um, the very first recommendation in, in Dame Alicia's report proposes that all allegations of excessive force uh, should continue to be reported immediately by Police Scotland's uh, PSD, the Professional Standards Department, uh, for instruction and investigation by the Independent Procurator Fiscal uh, or by PARC on the direction of Procurator Fiscal. So what we have from your own consideration is you know, welcome measures um, that, that Police Scotland are identifying and reporting appropriate cases, but importantly from, from Dame Alicia, a serious suggestion around how to, to, to further improve that, which again, Liam Kerr, forgive me, will take some time to reflect on, but I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a recommendation that um, should be given some very serious consideration in terms of the Crown's own, 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 own response to that and my own discussions, of course. I will speak to Lord Advocate in, in, in good time about the, uh, the, the, the interim report. Um, but, but, but again, Liam Kerr completely understands this, I know, but decisions about those criminal proceedings are entirely a matter for the Crown, um, and, and rightly, Lord Advocate guards, uh, fiercely guards the Crown's independence from political interference in that regard, and, and so he should. Um, it's entirely appropriate that that is left to the, to, 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 to the discretion of, of, of Lord Advocate and, and, and the Crown. Uh, thank you for that. Did, on the measures, very briefly, you mentioned the measures that had been brought in. Have you had any feedback on those measures and the impact of them, or is it not at that stage yet? No, no I haven't had uh, direct um, uh, feedback. I mean, I, I, I also obviously read um, the committee's report uh, on post-legislative scrutiny. I was quite comforted by, by what the committee uh, said in the report uh, in relation to this particular matter. Um, the evidence that you'd taken and, and the reassurances clearly from the report that you as a committee had already received gave me great comfort. Um, so, so I've not taken the conversation um, any further than that, but uh, clearly the Lord Advocate and I will be uh, chewing the fat over this uh, interim uh, report and what is a matter for Lord Advocate, he will of course take forward in, in his independent uh, role and of course what is a matter for other partner organisations uh, and, and, and the government we will, we will take forward. Thank you. Uh, slightly different topic, if I may. The, um, the, there was an, there's an issue around, or a concern around senior officers being subjected to their complaints being identified uh, in the media. Do you take a view at this stage uh, on whether the relevant regulations need to be amended uh, in light of that uh, to ensure they're not identified, or uh, is, is this not a concern at this stage? I, I think we should give... give um consideration to this uh, point. Uh, I thought Dame uh, Alicia Angelini uh, again was um, quite robust uh, in saying that she'd had conversations with, for example, uh, the park and others around um, when, when, when these things become public uh, and the fact that that can actually have a detrimental impact on public confidence and that the practice had, had ceased since she had those conversations uh, last year. And in terms of, you know, uh, actual uh, changes in regulations and so on and so forth. Excuse me, you'll, you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll again take some time um, to, to, to look over what Dame Alicia said, but also it's important to recognise what she herself, uh, Dame Alicia said herself, and I'll, I'll quote uh, directly. Um, she will give, quote-unquote, further consideration to the whole question of privacy, the public interest and the role of the media end quote in her final report um, but, but very much welcomes further views on this issue from the public and members of the press and, and media so um, I think we should have the conversations but I think Dame Elish takes the right tone in terms of we've got to have a, a really honest conversation 
um, and, and, and one with a lot of cool heads around the public interest, of which there always is going to be a public interest, the role of the media in scrutinising um, any, any of these uh, allegations. And, and again, there's a role there, not for investigation by the press, but certainly of public interest and, and, and so on, but also very much the rights of the individuals both making the complaint and being complained about. So these are not easy questions to, to get an answer to. Um, but, but, but I welcome what Dame Alicia said thus far. Uh, I welcome the conversations she's already had, for example, with, with the park. And I think it is, as Liam Kerr says, uh, a discussion that is very worthy of, um, um, uh, very worthy of further discussion um, as, as time goes on. And good morning to the Cabinet Secretary and the panel. Um, I'd like to ask a couple of questions around about whistleblowing. Um, I'm not sure what level of detail you'll be able to go into, CabSec, but I'd just like to ask a question about Police Scotland and SPA obviously already have their own whistleblowing policies. Have you had any concerns raised with you as to whether or not those policies are fit for purpose at the present time? Um, I mean, the interim report, as, as things stand, uh, does note that Police Scotland obviously recently published uh, up-to-date guidance in order to allow officers to report concerns um, or to whistleblow uh, and to award uh, and awarded a contract uh, to the company uh, Protect, which is Whistleblowing Advice uh, Limited. So that provides an independent advice uh, for whistleblowing matters. So that tells me two things, really. It tells me, one, that Police Scotland themselves noted that, you know, their whistleblowing procedures could be, could be improved. But secondly, it tells me, and this is the important point, that they've taken very credible action by bringing in, you know, that element of independence to to to, to improve um, their, their their procedures. Um, I think Dame Alice she, she did set out her intention to examine, explore whistleblowing processes. Um, she'll take, she said, further evidence and further advice from stakeholders, um, and 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 of course that will make up her part of her final report. So, um, yes, to, to 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 the question about, you know. Um, do, do I think whistleblowing policies are are, are fit for purpose uh, in terms of, of police calling SPAS? Um, but equally, this is going to be an issue that Dame Leash is clearly going to come back to, and I think it's important we wait for that final report um, before we decide on, on any potential next steps. That. Um, the PERC have told the committee that Police Scotland's policy does not provide any external confidential reporting system or mechanism and suggested that this could be helped by having the PERC uh, provide an independent oversight um, of that. Do you think that Police Scotland's whistleblowing policy should have some sort of external body like the PERC to police the police, as it were? Um, again, um, I know that Damien Leach's report uh, suggests that protection for whistleblowers uh, could be enhanced within policing um, by prescribing legislation um, in terms of another th Scottish third party reporting body or person. So, you know, that's that's there, it's, it's in the report, so we should give it some consideration. I don't want to take a view absolute here or now uh, about that. So th th there's a very firm suggestion about that third party um, a potential uh, reporting body. So So let's consider that. I know the review also took evidence from PERC, suggesting that legislative amendment could be made to provide the PERC with um, what is described as prescribed person status uh, and the legislative powers to independently investigate these matters. Um, but again, I go back to my answer to, to, to Jenna Guru's previous question. Um, Dame Alicia did say she's going to return to this matter in a final report. There's some really weighty suggestions. Um, let's let's give her the time to, to bring forward that final report before considering the matter further. But she's laid them on the table. There'll be a matter of discussion, conversation. Um, uh, but uh, as I say, let's wait for the final report, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you, there's an issue which has impacted on confidence in police complaints handling, and that's where police officers may retire or resign when a complaint uh, or an investigation is ongoing. The committee heard that this brings non-criminal investigations to a halt and it can be unsatisfactory for everyone involved. Would you agree that this is an unsatisfactory situation? Would you anticipate a change being required to ensure fairness in the process for everyone involved? Um, I would, I can understand where there's some concerns uh, around uh, when allegations are made uh, and the uh, officer then chooses to retire and there can be some ambiguity around the investigating roles and powers 
uh, they're for, and and so I completely understand, and um, I, I I'm quite keen to reflect very carefully on this. I, I understand that there's differing interpretations of uh, in terms of legislation, uh, persons serving with the police. Um, so again, if we're able to put that to bed. Uh, amend the relevant provisions at the, the earliest opportunity through unanimous agreement, hopefully with our partner organisations, then um, we we will give that very, very careful uh, consideration um, because where the ambiguity exists, where there's people think there's a, a potential loophole to get out of investigations, then clearly I, can, I agree with the convener's premise that that could have a detrimental impact on public confidence. So when she asked me the very first question in this committee about, you know, can we move quickly in terms of legislation with a unanimous agreement, I suppose this would be one of these areas where we look at the relevant provisions and see if we can try to give some certainty where there's, at the very least, some ambiguity. And um, while not making a specific um, recommendation, then in her report, 321, then Damien Leach does say that there may be merit, for example, in terms of the public interest in transparency and justice, and in line with the practice introduced in England and Wales by policing, uh, the Policing and Crime Act 2017, in allowing or requiring misconduct proceedings to operate even after an officer has resigned and even after he is unable or um, unwilling to engage with these proceedings. So is that something that um, you would consider looking at and that would be good to try and resolve this issue? I think well, there's good practice for us to, to look at uh, in jurisdictions uh, across the rest of the United Kingdom that we should, we should look towards that. Um, and I've always said that in, in a variety of, of, of matters. I'm often you know, the first to, to, to make mention of the fact that uh, other jurisdictions look towards Scotland. Um, but clearly, if there are things that we can learn <coughs> of, of, of best practice, um, that's not always the case that such things can be translated from, from, from England and Wales to, to, to Scotland. Um, but uh, looking at the, the paragraphs that I think the convener is making mention of from kind of 319 to 322, um, they, they, they will be given consideration um, but again you'll forgive me convener I won't commit here and now that we will absolutely do what is being asked but we will take forward those conversations they, they, they may well be merit in the suggestions being made by Dame Alicia Angelini on, on this front and I suppose turning it round um, to look at it from the other aspect, given the wide-ranging and, and complex nature of, of complaints, would there be uh, some merit in looking at certain category of complaint which should not uh, or should not be um, continued by retiral of, of officers, if I looked at it that way, rather than discontinued? Um, I'll be careful. Uh, about, uh, about that, I understand where where Margaret Mitchell uh, is coming from, where the convener is coming from. Let me go back to my answer to, to, to John Finney. If there's kind of more grievance type issues that are being raised, and then somebody retires as their merit in pursuing those grievances, uh, that's a conversation we could absolutely have. But I just think um, I would like to reflect very carefully, not just with our partner organisations, but particularly those that have uh, an experienced background in, in HR, excuse me, about the potential implications of what's being suggested and any potential unintended consequences. What, what I have at the forefront of my mind is making sure that we have transparency, that we have fairness in the system, that we have public confidence in the system. Um, and I think you know anything that enhances that, then we should give very, very serious consideration to Given that you've mentioned a couple of times that there is clearly an impact on public confidence, are you disappointed there isn't a specific rec recommendation in this area? Can you say that again? Sorry, Given that you've um, said several times that this is an issue that impacts on public confidence, are you disappointed that there isn't a specific ref recommendation on, on this issue? Uh, no, I wouldn't say I'm disappointed. Um, I think there's a lot. I mean, it's a very substantial report for, for an interim report. Uh, you know, this is a really weighty document. So uh, I think there's a lot in there for us to reflect on. I think just with the changes that hopefully we'll make in relation to the interim report, I think will make a big, big difference 
um, in terms of of, of of the complaints uh, procedure and the handling of complaints. When I talk about public confidence, um, I should say, I mean, I, I still think the public um, have uh, high confidence um, uh, in, 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 in complaints being investigated. But clearly, you know, we, we cannot ignore what has happened over the last few years and, and the fact that, that might well have, have, have dented that public confidence. So, um, no, I think I, I'm not disappointed. I think there's, this is a weighty interim report. I think there's a lot in there. I think there'll be some good changes made on the back of it. And, of course, uh, when the final report is ready for publication and is published, then, of course, there'll be further round of discussions about what more we can do to improve the process. Okay. Um, can I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary? That concludes our evidence uh, uh, session. And the committee appreciates the speed at which Dame Eilish has completed her interim report and very much looks forward to hearing the progress that the Cabinet Secretary uh, makes over summer, in particular, implementing legislating changes or um, persuading cabinet colleagues to make that a priority. Can I just finish by uh, wishing you, Cabinet Secretary, a, a restful sum, summer, summer. Thank you again for um, appearing so, so soon after the publication of the report. And we look forward to seeing you again after recess. Having an eight-week-old baby, I'm not convinced I'll have a restful recess, but nonetheless, I hope that you'll think of me uh, as you're sunning yourself uh, on the various beaches that you'll all be in inhabiting, no doubt. But listen, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you on the other side of recess. It's a bit of an optimistic hope. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and I suspend uh, briefly for five minutes. Got it?
next item of business today is an evidence session on the newly introduced Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill. And I welcome the Scottish Government's Bill team to the committee. This is an opportunity for us to find out more about the purposes of this bill, which we'll scrutinise in more detail. So we have with us um, this morning, Elaine Hamilton, Bill Team Leader, Ewan Dick, Deputy Director, Police Division, and Louise Miller, Directorate of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk, and um, can I ask Ms Hamilton to make some opening remarks to outline the bill, and then we'll move to questions. Thank you, convener. Um, the purpose of the bill is to put in place new oversight arrangements for the collection, use, retention and disposal of biometric data in the context of policing and criminal justice. And by biometric data, I'm referring to fingerprints and DNA um, and other data which is currently being developed, such as facial recognition software and any other forms of data uh, which may emerge in the future, which we can't even imagine at the moment. The oversight arrangements will focus on the creation of a new biometrics commissioner who will have a range of functions. The oversight arrangements will apply to Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. And the bill allows a power for Scottish ministers to insert additional bodies uh, should that be required in future. To ensure the impartiality of the post holder, the commissioner will be appointed by the Crown on the recommendation of the Parliament and the Commissioner will be, will be accountable to Parliament for the performance of his or her functions and expenditure. Now, the need for independent oversight arises from ethical, legal and human rights considerations associated with the use of biometric data. It is vital that the public has confidence in police use of biometric data. Given that biometric data and samples captured by Police Scotland may be taken without an individual's consent, it is all the more important to ensure that there's adequate protection of rights and independent oversight of police powers in this respect. The need for independent oversight has been identified in a number of independent reports, most recently the 2018 report by the Independent Advisory Group on the use of biometric data. The, the, Scottish, the consultation undertaken by the Scottish Government following the group's report also indicated broad support for these arrangements. So turning firstly to the Commissioner's general function, this is to support and promote the adoption of lawful, ethical and effective practices in relation to the collection, use, retention and disposal of biometric data. This means that the Commissioner will keep under review policy, practice and the law relating to biometric data in the context of policing criminal justice. The Commissioner will also promote public awareness and understanding of biometric data and how police powers and duties are exercised, and indeed how those powers and duties may be monitored and challenged. The Commissioner will also prepare and promote um, a code of practice. Finally, his, his or her functions also include carrying out research and making recommendations in relation to any matter relevant to their function. In carrying out these functions, the Commissioner is required to promote in particular the interests of children and young people and vulnerable adults. I'd now like to say just a little bit more about the Code of Practice. So the Commissioner is to prepare a Code of Practice in consultation with a list of prescribed stakeholders, including Police Scotland, the SPA, PERC, HMICS, etc., and indeed anyone else that the Commissioner considers appropriate. The Code must then be approved by Scottish Ministers and laid before the, laid before the Parliament. Uh, the content of the Code uh, can be reviewed at any time, but must, there must be a report uh, on the Code every four years. Uh, the bill requires there to be a code, but it does not specify the content of the code. And this is important because it allows the commissioner to use his or her own judgment and the input of stakeholders to shape the code. We would anticipate that the code will provide information and guidance, setting out the standards and responsibilities of Police Scotland and the SPA with the aim of ensuring good practice, driving continuous improvement and, enha uh, and enhancing accountability. Uh, SP and Police Scotland will be legally obliged to have regard to the code. Now, to enable the Commissioner to perform his or her functions, the Commissioner will have the power to request information. Should the information be refused, concealed or destroyed, then the Commissioner has a remedy to the Court of Session, who would consider the matter. 
If an order is made by the court, then it would be contempt of court to ignore it. Having considered the information about the collection, use, retention and disposal of biometric data, the Commissioner may wish to make a recommendation. Should no response be forthcoming to the recommendation, then the Commissioner would reference this in a report to Parliament, which is made public. Therefore, the sanction is name and shame, so to speak. So, in conclusion, uh, what we have here is a Commissioner who will encourage and support the fulfilment by Police Scotland and the SPA <clears throat> of their functions in a, matter, in a manner which respects fundamental rights, the law and ethics. This support will include promoting good practice, identifying systemic deficiencies and providing a measure of transparency, which together will promote public confidence in policing and in the criminal justice system. Thank you for these opening um, remarks. That's very helpful. Before I bring John Finney in, can I ask just a, um, a question about behavioural characteristics? Can you give an example of what that would um, include? <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of a summer cold. Um, behavioural characteristics would include analysis of, for example, a person's gait or a person's pattern of speech. A stammer or a, a very defining um, characteristic in, in their behaviour. Um, if they twitched or blinked or something like that, then that could be helpful. OK, John Finney. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for that uh, resume, Ms Hamilton. I have a couple of questions, please. Particularly around the status of that code. Could you, you know, uh, it's very hard to predict the future, but four years on, if things go the way, what status does that code have and what... What requirements is there to adhere to it and what would the sanction be if someone hadn't adhered to it? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the code of practice, as I say, will set out um, the standards and the responsibilities expected of Police Scotland and the SPA. And the expectation is that they will have internal systems in place to ensure that there is transparency in how they exercise their powers uh, and that these powers... Um, observe human rights and ethical considerations. Now, if um, the Commissioner felt that Police Scotland or SP were not having regard to the code, then the Commissioner can make a recommendation that they have regard to a certain part of the code. If Police Scotland and or the SP respond, then the Commissioner will consider that response. Um, if he feels that he has not had a response, then that, ma that matter can be reported to the Parliament and made public. Therefore, um, there is no legal sanction for failing to observe the code, but there is a sanction of reputational damage. And I think that is a very powerful sanction. And um, in my discussions with Professor Wiles, who is the Biometrics Commissioner for England and Wales, uh, he does not have... Um, sanctions either in terms of enforcement powers and he feels he does not need the enforcement powers he feels that that would adversely affect his relationship with uh, with the police forces in England and Wales therefore um, while I can understand there may be some concerns about a lack of teeth in practice that does not appear to be an issue and indeed the um, provisions which are made in the bill for name and shame, um, appear to be adequate. Uh, thanks very much indeed for, for that. Can I ask about, would there be any retrospective application? Um, no. Um, the Code of Practice will come into effect on a day uh, set by regulations by the Scottish Ministers and laid before the Parliament uh, through the affirmative procedure. I wonder if you'd formed a view of what the public might think about the likelihood of um, compliance um, when we had a situation where, with regard to the role taken by the Information Commissioner in relation to Police Scotland's uh, proposed deployment of cyber kiosks, then notwithstanding the Information Commissioner and many other people's very precise view about the legitimacy of that, nonetheless, Police Scotland considered it appropriate to go ahead. Um, this, I think the, the Cabinet Secretary um, was quite clear when he appeared before the committee on the 13th of June that the, the legality of um, the cyber kiosk is a matter for, for Police Scotland um, and the SPA. Um, 
in terms of the remit of this particular commissioner proposed in the bill, certainly um, part of his, of his remit um, would be looking at developing technologies and ensuring that there's proper validation of those technologies before they are deployed and ensuring that human rights and ethical considerations have been taken account of also. Okay, I won't push further on that. Thank you very much, Dave. Supplementary, Liam Kerr. Are you able to tell us, is, is there anything driving this process now? What has mandated this coming forward just now? Is there, are there any breaches, for want of a better word? And if so, is it therefore time critical uh, in terms of how we move forward on this? Thank you. Um, no, the, the, the Scottish Government's position on this is that Police Scotland and the SP work to very high standards. Therefore, there's no suggestion that this commissioner is required because of any deficiencies in their performance. Um, I think that, <clears throat> as I mentioned in my introductory comments, there, are, there have been a few independent reports in recent years, um, including the Independent Advisory Group's report in 2018 and a report by HMICS in 2016, both of which called for independent oversight arrangements. Now, in England and Wales, there have been independent oversight arrangements for a, a number of years now, and therefore there was felt to be a gap in, in Scotland. And I think if, if we consider the times in which we live, so many processes are, are now um, propelled by um, technology, and uh, in particular biometric technology, that the Scottish Government understands that the public will naturally be concerned about issues such as privacy and security of, of data. Therefore, there's been a, an alignment of um, a number of factors here uh, which now make the, uh, the creation of this commissioner um, all the more appropriate. Ask one supplementary and then a substantive question. Just following on from the convener's question about uh, behavioural characteristics, I, I, I just have a question about the definition of biometric data that's included in the bill. Um, partly because subsection 2 of section 23 um, has, a, and I accept that it's a may include list, um, but it doesn't, the list of, of types of data doesn't actually include behavioural characteristics itself. But more importantly, my concern stems from the fact that much machine learning doesn't actually codify those behavioural characteristics in terms of information as such. There's a system which can identify these behaviours, but it's not one that can actually articulate what information is being held by people. So I, I've, I have a concern that, that the way in which biometric data has been defined may not capture uh, all means and manner by which that biometric uh, data is, is used or people identified by their, their behavioural characteristics. I'm just wondering to what extent the Bill team has looked into that and has covered uh, th that off. And, and just, are, are you confident that this definition of biometric data is comprehensive? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the definition of biometric data was considered very carefully um, by the Bill team, and we were trying to um, offer a, a very broad, comprehensive definition which would allow for future proofing given that this is a very fast-paced uh, technology. Um, ultimately, the definition provided in this bill is not meant to define biometric data generally. Rather, uh, the definition in this bill is for the purposes of this bill and for setting out the scope of the Commissioner's uh, remit. So just to be clear, um, in this bill, biometric data means information about an individual's physical, biological, physiological or behavioural characteristics which may establish the identity of an individual either on its own or when combined with other information. And when we say information about a person's physical characteristics, this would include, um, for example, facial recognition. Information about biological characteristics would include, for example, a DNA profile. Uh, which can be, der be derived from blood, saliva, hair, etc. Information about physiological characteristics would include vein patterns. Information about behavioural characteristics, uh, as I mentioned earlier, would be could be a person's gait or speech pattern. Therefore, 
in, in offering this definition in the bill, we have tried to be as broad as, as possible, and indeed we have gone broader than other definitions of biometric data which are, are currently in existence, such as the GDPR definition, which does focus more on uh, data which has undergone some sort of um, chemical uh, process. Okay, uh, thank you. I mean, I think I think this is an area I'd, 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 I'd like to examine further is that the, the bill um, is scrutinised because I, I think there is a difference between data and information, and, and I think it's an important one, and in particular with regard to machine learning. But in terms of my uh, substantive question, we've, we've just been uh, taking evidence uh, regarding the, the uh, preliminary report on police complaints. You know, we have uh, four bodies uh, that, that oversee uh, or are either involved or oversee policing. Indeed, if you include HMICS, you could argue that it's five. This is potentially introducing a sixth. I note from your policy memorandum, consideration was given to whether or not these functions could be given to another body such as PERC. Is there a concern that we are creating a crowded landscape for police governance? What what? Uh, steps are taken within the bill to, to avoid that and indeed could, could uh, the bill team perhaps just cover off why uh, the, the, the providing these functions to the PERC or the SP or some other body uh, was rejected in favour of creating a separate p a commissioner? Yes, of course. Um, certainly the we do have um, a regulatory landscape in Scotland in terms of the roles of HMICS and, and PERC. And um, it is the policy of the Scottish ministers not to create a new public body unless there is an absolute need for it, unless there is a, the, the functions cannot be uh, carried by an existing body. And to that end, a, a robust options appraisal was undertaken in, in May of last year, which did consider um, existing bodies such as HMICS and PERC. Um, and I think that uh, when it comes to HMSAS and, and PERC in particular, I mean, certainly they are very well established in their respective areas of expertise, but they don't currently have a remit across all areas of biometrics. And if we were to widen their remit, then that could lead to a loss of focus for them and negatively impacting on the perceived authority and the credibility um, that they have. And on that basis, um, using an existing body um, was, was considered not optimal. I think as well, it would, to have added to the, the remit of either of those bodies would have represented a, a fundamental shift in their, their purpose. Um, so undoubtedly, HMICS and PERC have valuable roles to play, but the options appraisal uh, identified that they weren't ideally placed to take on an additional function such as this. Um, I think also the need for a, a new parliamentary commissioner was, was really on the basis of um, having that fresh approach to supporting improvements in the setting, monitoring and enforcing of standards. Um, and this option of a, of a new body scored the highest for benefits realisation, particularly around strength and oversight and accountability of public services. And it also offered the value of ensuring a proportionate and effective approach to biometric data and additional capacity to support world-class innovation, uh, research and development. So I think also a, a new parliamentary commissioner would function independently without any perception of undue influence from policing related bodies. So there's a number of reasons there as to why um, it was felt inappropriate to use HMICS or PERC and it was actually a, a more optimal solution to use a completely uh, new parliamentary commissioner. I, I wonder, could you set out when a code of practice will be um, available even in a draft form? Um, the provisions of the bill are such that the code of practice is to be prepared by the biometrics commissioner in consultation with a list of prescribed bodies. Um, <laughs> And the whole point of having an impartial commissioner is that they are not under the direction of um, Parliament or indeed Scottish ministers. Therefore, it's difficult for me to say exactly 
when the, the code of practice uh, would be produced. I would hope that the code of practice will be the new commissioner's top priority. Um, and as I say, the, um, there is a requirement for the commissioner to prepare the code in conjunction with stakeholders, which always takes time, um, and then for that code to be approved by Scottish ministers and then for the code to be laid before Parliament. So there is a, a time element here. Um, in terms of uh, existing material that, that could be drawn on to inform that code, um, the, the Scottish Government prepared a, a, a concept of operations code which was part of its uh, consultation last year. And there will be existing standards, for example, from the Forensic Science Regulator, which the, the new Commissioner could choose to draw from. Um, therefore, one would hope that the Commissioner will not be starting off with a completely blank sheet, but um, in, in terms of respecting the impartiality of the post holder, I wouldn't like to, to estimate as to when that code might be produced. So it's after the bills publish, par, published and introduced by secondary legislation? Sorry? It would be after the bill is um, passed by Parliament and um, introduced by secondary Indeed. legislation. Indeed. Yeah. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit. You mentioned raising awareness. Now, I'm not sure if that was um, just about the role of the Commissioner and new Commissioner or about the legislation itself. Could you clarify that and just say how um, it's intended to raise awareness with the public? Um. Yes, uh, one of the functions of the new commissioner will be to raise public awareness um, of police powers and duties in respect of biometric data. Um, again, because the post is impartial, it will be for the, the commissioner to, to decide how he or she will, will go about that. Um, we would expect the commissioner to liaise with parliamentarians, with various um, representative groups, with the media, in order to raise awareness, um, as I say, of, of rights um, and duties in respect of biometric data. It's always, um, I think, quite a grey area, you know, it sounds very good, but actually putting into um, some detail and, and practice how you do reason the awareness is, is not so clear. Can I ask if there's a budget for doing this? Um, yes, the financial memorandum sets out the costings in relation to the proposed uh, legislation. Um, which I cannot find at the moment. Um, so, um, yes, the, that particular part of the rule has been costed. Um, there is a budget for uh, publications. Um, there is a budget for travel and subsistence. So this would cover the, the costs of the commissioner maybe travelling uh, around the country, attending conferences or um, public meetings to, to provide information. So yes, the, there is a costing for that, but not specifically um, in, in terms of public awareness raising, it's sort of wrapped up in the, the travel and subsistence uh, and the salaries and other admin costs. And the budget is? Uh, the budget for travel and subsistence is £4,000 per annum. Um, the administrative costs are £2,000 per annum. Um, do you wish to know the, the salary, the remuneration? Course. Why not? Okay. <laughs> so um, the commissioner's remuneration is estimated at fifty-seven thousand pounds, and the staff salary is at one hundred and sixty-seven thousand pounds, based on three full-time equivalents. Thank you. That's that's helpful. I think that concludes our um, questioning. Uh, can I thank the bill deal, uh, the bill team, for providing evidence today, and suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave.
Our next item of business today is the report back from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing's meeting, which took place on the 13th of June 2019. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to give his report. Convener, uh, on the 13th of June, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing took oral evidence on Police Scotland's proposal to introduce the use of digital device triage systems, uh, commonly known as cyber kiosk, to search mobile phones. And that, that uh, session was with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. And the Cabinet Secretary told the committee that it was for Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to satisfy themselves that they have the legal basis to proceed in deploying the use of cyber kiosks, adding that if there's any difference in opinion in relation to law, it would be up to the courts to make a determination. Uh, although he was not advocating that particular approach. The Cabinet Secretary explained his intention to form an inde independently chaired reference group to scope the possible legal and ethical issues arising from new and emerging tele technological developments. He confirmed that this group could also consider existing technologies such as cyber kiosks. The intention is that the work of this group will be open and transparent and that ethical and human rights considerations will be central to its work. The Cabinet Secretary confirmed that he is confident that lessons have been learned from the proposal to roll out cyber chaos and that Police Scotland has the necessary processes in place to provide confidence and reassurance to victims and witnesses of a crime whose phones may be searched. However, he also acknowledged that Police Scotland has been unable to address the concerns raised by the Scottish Human Rights Association and the Information Commissioner's Office telling the subcommittee that it's incumbent on Police Scotland and the SBA to do their utmost to give as much confidence as possible to the public prior to deploying cyber kiosks. This was the final evidence session on this particular issue uh, prior to the summer recess, and I understand that Police Scotland's intention is to deploy cyber kiosks in late summer. Thank you. Are there any questions from members? Thank you, John, for, the, for that report. Um, before we conclude in public, as this is the very last meeting of the Justice Committee before the summer recess, um, I want to wish everyone a very restful summer. We will return in September. But I'd also like to take a moment on the record to express the Committee's thanks to our longest serving member of the clerking team, Christine Lambert. <laughs> Christine will be retiring from the staff of the Scottish Parliament at the end of the month and has supported the work of the Justice Committee and I think she must have um, a medal for this over the last past three sessions, which is something I believe of a record, Christine, so well done for that. Uh, Christine's dedicated and professional, uh, professional approach to her work has won her the respect and gratitude of all those she has worked with over the years, so that's past and present members of committees. And her work behind the scenes has contributed immensely to the smooth running of, her, of our committees and our meetings. On behalf of the, the members, Christine, the Justice Committee wants to say thank you and to wish you the very best for the future. And I'm now going to ask John Finney on behalf of the subcommittee for policing to say a few words. There will be a very few words. You, you, you've covered it comprehensively. It is Christine's continual support, often in the face of uh, very testing time schedules and the like, and our professionalism. Uh, so I'm very grateful, sitting with my back to Christine here, so, <laughs> um, for all her support. Um, a, a, a very personal thanks too, because she's been very helpful to me. And with that, I now bring this meeting to uh, a close, at least the public part of it will continue in private.